The Motor City Machine Guns are here in WWE, and I could not be happier. What's going on, guys? Welcome to my Friday Night SmackDown audio review for October 18th, 2024. I am a voiceless Graham G.S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Having a great weekend so far. Not exactly voiceless, but I was out at New York Comic Con all day yesterday. Had a great time. Fun time, as always. Um, I was intending to come back for SmackDown to watch it live. Missed it. Had to watch it on delay. Avoided spoilers. Enjoyed the show. We're going to get into that today, but... Uh, back to what I said a moment ago, New York Comic Con, had a fun time. I was there all day, fucking exhausted, woke up today exhausted, still tired, uh, voice still shot from talking, walking, everything, and I know that, what does that have to do with walking around, I know, but just being tired has kind of affected my voice, so I apologize for that in advance, but this is not a tired occasion, this is not an occasion to be tired. I was super pumped watching SmackDown uh, back last night for the Motor City Machine Guns more over than anything else. I thought this was a good show. Um, a lot like what we've seen from SmackDown in the last couple of weeks. You know, starting in the fall, I think, coming out of SummerSlam and then Bash in Berlin specifically. I think they've done a really good job of reshuffling the deck with the Bloodline storyline, the Cody Rhodes stuff, uh, now focusing on Crown Jewel. The women's division's been decent, and now the tag team division is getting a much-needed boost as well. And SmackDown already had a pretty decent tag team division, but now when you add the fucking Motor City Machine Guns into the mix, things are about to get even more exciting. So I'll get to the Motor City Machine Guns in a little bit, but I thought the overall show was enjoyable. Um, they open up the episode on a pretty high note, with the bloodline out there, Solo Sokoa saying that Roman Reigns has to come out there and acknowledge him by the end of the show. I thought Roman might inter uh, might you know interrupt here and say I don't acknowledge you I acknowledge you whatever we got that at the end of the night we did indeed get that at the end of SmackDown but it, what what we got here instead was an appearance from the Intercontinental Champion from Raw Jey Uso confronting Solo Sokoa the first you know I think we saw I was going to say the first interaction between these two since like before Mania or whatever but I think we saw them interact very briefly backstage. Um, I want to say a backlash. They were backstage coming off of the debut of Tonga Loa. Solo and Tama Tonga had just beaten Orton and Owens in a tag team match. And I think Jey Uso is preparing for his World Heavyweight Championship match against Damian Priest. And they had quickly, you know, crossed paths. This was a full-on confrontation. Jey Uso mentioning that, you know... Yeah, you don't need to divide the family anymore. And Solo said, I'm not trying to divide the family. I'm trying to unite the family. I am your tribal chief. Roman Reigns is not. I am your new tribal chief. And you will acknowledge me. Jey Uso did, in fact, not acknowledge Solo Sokoa and walked off. That right there, folks, is why Jey Uso, or rather how Jey Uso, is going to lose the Intercontinental Championship uh, coming up on Monday's Raw when he faces Braun Breaker. We were just discussing this, and I put the clip up here on the channel the other day. We were just discussing how, or what rather, um, or yeah, I guess really how, Braun Breaker was going to beat Jey Uso for that championship. Would it be clean? Would he get the belt back at all? I think they did this on the show, not only to get us closer to the Bloodline OG reunion, Roman, Jimmy, Jay, all getting back on the same page, but I feel like they did that, <clears throat> excuse me, on this show because they want the Bloodline to go to Raw and cost Jay that Intercontinental Championship. That's what I'm thinking is going to happen, and that's going to convince Jay, maybe not to forgive Jimmy and Roman quite, you know, so quickly. We'll get to that momentarily. They had their own confrontation on the show backstage, actually. But it might want, it might allow him to exact revenge. He might want to get revenge in the Bloodline for costing him the Intercontinental Championship. So that's what I think is going to happen, and I think they did this segment for a reason, so we'll find out on Monday's Raw. But back to what I, what I mentioned and alluded to a moment ago, uh, Jay interacting with Roman Reigns and Jimmy Uso backstage. They came across each other. Jimmy tried to talk to Jay on Monday's Raw backstage. Didn't exactly work out well for Jimmy. Jay just kind of ignored him and moved on. He acknowledged them, uh, no pun intended here, but Roman had mentioned, listen, before Jay could walk off, he said, listen, we're proud of you. We all are for the fact that he became Intercontinental Champion. Jay did exactly what he said that he would set out to do. Took him a little bit longer than he probably thought it would, and that we all thought it would, but, you know, he still went on to become Intercontinental Champion, a champion on his own. Roman mentioning that I'm, I'm proud of you. And Jay just simply said, no yeet, and then walked away. A um, couple things here. One, I'm glad it wasn't that easy for Jay to say, oh yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. And then, like, 
he's already back in their good graces or vice versa. They're already back in his good graces. No, I mean, I think that's nice. It's a step in the right direction. It's also realistic, too. When you have two people that don't like each other and have a lot of prior issues, I'm not really sure what Jay would apologize to Roman for, but I think in storyline, Roman's got to apologize to Jay Uso for the years of treating him like shit and for kind of him reaching his breaking point last year. And then also, G, uh, Jimmy Uso as well has got to apologize. It's not as simple as, hey, we need you to take out Solo Sokoa. We need your help. Uh, you know, I, I feel like that would just be shitty for Jimmy to be like, yeah, we need your help. And then Jay's like, sure. He also has to apologize. He turned on his brother. He betrayed his brother last year and cost him the world championship. He cost him the tag titles. He cost him a whole lot of fucking things. He cost him, actually, the Intercontinental Championship when he first challenged for the championship about, you know, earlier this year on Raw against Gunther. Jimmy was why Jay did not become champion. That set up their Mania match, which was already in the works anyway for WrestleMania, but that kind of uh, rekindled their rivalry in time for the show of shows. So Jimmy has a lot to apologize for as well. Jay, not so much, but we have to get that before Jay can be like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll say hi or like, you know, say hi, I'll, I'll say hi, what the fuck am I saying? I'll help you guys out. I'll help you out against the new bloodline, blah, blah, blah. What I didn't really like about this, I thought that was well done, because Roman was like, yeah, I told you it wouldn't work, blah, 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 which is exactly how it would work in real life if that were to happen. Um, what I did not like about this was how Jay just said no yeet. And it was supposed to be like this clever, cute thing. Roman did it to Jimmy last week, when Jimmy kind of alluded to needing help before they even got beat down by the bloodline that same show. Roman just said to Jimmy, no yeet. And then they moved on, because the crowd was saying yee, Jay, whatever. And he said, no yeet. And it was funny because Jimmy used to say no yeet in backstage segments after he turned on Jay. He would say that to Roman, blah, blah, blah. So I thought that was cute. On this show, not so much. Jay, I would have rather he just walked away or just said, listen, that's not enough. Or, I mean, that, that I, I talk about realism. That wasn't realistic. That was just stupid. For him to recite his old tired catchphrase. And I love the yeet stuff. I say tired. It's not exactly tired. But I want the Jay Uso with depth to reunite with Roman and Jimmy. Not just because he's eating and eating here, eating there, eating all over the place. I apologize for the, um, you know, inappropriateness, but he's constantly eating and that's great. People love it, but we need the actual human being Jay Uso out there or, you know, in whatever segment with Roman and Jimmy communicating like a human being and not just saying, no, ye, ye, you know, ye, ye, like, I like Jay Uso when he's cutter when he's cutting deeper promos, like we got last week on Raw, not this past week, but the week before that, when he was out there and he was like, you know, I won this for my mom, and like that was cool. Like I like when we can see Jay Uso as a human being and not just out there repeating the same catchphrase, which can become easy to do when the crowd's so into it. That's like Stone Cold out there just reciting the same catchphrases and not actually doing any actual character work. You know what I mean? Or The Rock as well, which The Rock would also do that quite a bit. But I want serious Jay when necessary. And that was a serious moment, and he did the no yeet thing. I thought that was silly. But overall, I like that they're taking their time with this. More on that later in the main event segment. Uh, We are getting a WWE Tag Team title, number one contenders tournament. A lot of tournaments in WWE. Uh, Granted, this is a shorter one and not a full-blown bracket tournament. Uh, There are, or were rather on the show, two triple threat matches with the winners of those matches facing off on next week's SmackDown, and the winners of that match then challenging the Bloodline for the WWE Tag Team titles. In this triple threat match, it was DIY, Pretty Deadly, in the Street Profits, a fun match, fun, fast-paced affair. Crowd was into it, really good action. DIY and the Profits work wonderfully together, and I like uh, Pretty Deadly as well. They took the pinfall here, as they should have. It is worth noting that the Profits pinned another member of... um, pretty deadly at the exact same time, but it did not count for two reasons. One, Jessica Carr didn't see it. And two, I think it was because that member of the pretty deadly that they were pinning was not legal. The member that DIY pinned was legal and that's why they won. I thought it was just because she saw them, but it was also because no, you have to be legal and they weren't legal. So I thought that was interesting. They just didn't win clean. They are clearly continuing the Usho, Usho, um, instead of Uso, I guess I said Usho, they are clearly continuing the issue between DIY and the Street Profits, which I like because they were bickering backstage last week. They were blaming each other for the other team losing, for themselves losing in that WWE Tag Team title ladder match two weeks ago. 
I like what we've gotten here. I think it's really well done. And it leads me to believe one of those teams is going heel. Um, I mean, they have DIY. They have the Profits. And now they have the Motor City Machine Gun. So they do have a wealth of heel tag teams already. They probably don't need to turn either one of those teams. Um, but I think they might. DIY acted opportunistically here to make me think they might go heel. When you have Candice and Indy, who are other former members of the way acting heel, it makes me think they might reunite, but all is heels. Okay. But then you also have the Profits. And I feel like it's more likely DIY would go heel because they haven't been heels yet on the main roster. Except for that one match they had like fucking a couple years ago, which I think was also actually, they were baby faces. But anyway, um, they haven't been heels yet as a team on the main roster. I would not turn them heel. But I just feel like it's more likely than the Prophets who already tried the heel thing about a year ago with Bobby and it didn't work because they were too over and people didn't want to boo them. So they had to turn back the baby faces soon after. Um, but the Prophets were the ones that got fucked here and they might be the ones to turn on DIY because they were screwed out of an opportunity. Even though they weren't really screwed, it was a clean win for DIY. They won fair and square. So that's something to keep an eye on. I thought that was interesting. Kind of a random match. Not not random, but I thought it was weird when I saw it was advertised. I'm thinking, I don't know how much the crowd will really care about this one. Lash Legend and Piper Niven going one-on-one -on -one in the show. And I honestly expected it to be no good. I like Piper Niven. Lash Legend has improved. To her credit, she has improved. I haven't seen like a lot of barn burners with her in them. I thought she had a good showing in that uh, deadline match. That Iron Survivor Challenge about a year ago in NXT. It's either she's not getting more opportunities or I just I just don't think that she's great and there's just other women that are better than her in NXT. But her and Jakara Jackson are a fine team. They have their fair share of fans online. Um, I'm not a big fan of the whole metaphor shtick. I think it I think it sucks personally, but you know, they're two fine talents. I say all of that to kind of preface what I'm about to say. I thought Lash Legend actually looked really good here. I don't know if it was the fact that she faced Piper Niven. I don't know if it was the fact that it was a shorter match. I don't know. But shockingly, the crowd actually got behind her by the end of the match. Now, these are two heels. Uh, Metaphor, Legend, and Jackson actually cost damage control the tag team titles by standing in the crowd last week on Raw. They faced Bianca and Jay last week on SmackDown. So they are established heels, including in NXT. Although they were baby faces, I thought, for a while. I have no fucking clue. But Piper Niven's also a heel. She doesn't win a lot of matches, so there's really no reason to care about this match or take it seriously. Yet I thought they had a decent match and went in there and had a nice sprint. Lash Legend in particular, I thought, looked really good there by the end, hitting some moves on Piper that actually looked great. So I gotta give Lash Legend her credit here in looking really, really good. And I would say in defeat, but she didn't even lose. She beat Piper Niven. So it makes you wonder, she's an NXT talent. They were beaten in like fucking two minutes. This actually lasted longer, I think, than Bianca and Jade's WWE Women's Tag Team title match against Metaphor's Legend and Jackson last week on SmackDown. This was like three minutes, that was like two. So I think this lasted longer. But it does make you think if they're giving her a win over a SmackDown talent, are Legend and just uh, Jakara Jackson on their way up to the main roster officially? They might be. They're facing damage control on Tuesday's NXT. So they're not completely done in NXT yet, but uh, that would be interesting if they are main roster bound. I would not be surprised. I think they should capitalize on this performance here by having another good performance against damage control on Tuesday's NXT, but time will tell. Cody Rhodes went out to the ring to address Gunther. Uh, good promo here. They're doing a whole lot to make me care about Cody. And, I mean, the match itself I care about. They're really trying hard to make you care about, to get you to care about the Crown Jewel Championship. I don't give a fuck. And they try to make it feel important by having um, the security guards carry the championship out to the ring for the men and the women, specifically the men here. I don't know if they did it with the women later on. I'm not sure. But they really want you to care about those titles. I cannot bring myself to give a shit. I really don't. I, know, I don't know how many people... I'm not sure how many people actually do. The match itself will be good. I thought this was your typical average Rhodes promo. Nothing great, nothing bad. It was good. And he called out Gunther to appear on SmackDown next week. So they went face-to-face -face on Gunther's territory on Monday night. They're going to be in Cody's territory next Friday night on SmackDown in Brooklyn. So I thought he did an effective job of hyping the match, addressing Gunther, um, establishing an issue between the two, and moreover than anything, trying to get you to care about the Crown Jewel Championship. I still do not. But he's trying, and I applaud him for the effort. Um, on the subject of Cody, Orton was backstage talking to Nick Aldis 
Uh, Cody was out in the ring here. Kevin Owens was not at SmackDown, apparently. I thought it was cool because he had a video that he wanted them to play on Raw, which, why on Raw? I guess because Cody was there. He's not a Raw guy. Cody's not a Raw guy. KO's not a a Raw guy. So in storyline, I'm not sure why he would expect them to play his video explaining his actions on Raw. They didn't. He said, if they don't put it up by SmackDown, then I'll just air it myself. And he, he put it up on Twitter anyway. He was like... I don't trust them to actually air this, so I'm going to put it up on Twitter regardless before the show, which he did. I didn't see that, which I'll get to the Motor City Machine Guns thing in a second, because they also announced that ahead of time on on Twitter, which I also did not see because I was out, like I said. Um, He aired this promo on Twitter. It was a short, like, two-minute promo with him sitting in his car, which he always is. Like, anytime I've interviewed KO, I think he's always sitting in his car. He doesn't do it from his home um, or wherever. He's always sitting in a fucking car somewhere, which is really funny. But, you know, he just mentioned how he doesn't really feel like he's the bad guy. He was kind of disgusted in Randy for choosing Cody's side and not his own. He thought he and Orton had something special. And, um, yeah, Orton just said, I want to make him pay for it. So it looks like they're going with an Orton-Owens feud for now until we get Cody and Owens again. Now, I saw the rumor or the report from Friday or the other day indicating that we would get Cody and KO again, which you have to after what we got after Bad Blood went off the air and whatever that it would be at Saturday night's main event and not at Survivor Series. That makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's already silly enough we have to deal with this crown jewel bullshit with the two champion versus champion matches. That's dumb enough. Why would you not do it at Survivor Series? Unless Cody's going to be teaming with the Bloodline or the OG Bloodline, which, again, would be fucking stupid. Sami Zayn has way more of a reason to be in that match over Cody Rhodes at this point. Why would Cody continue to distract himself with Gunther and then with the Bloodline again? before he settles a score with KO. That would be stupid. So hopefully, I mean, they could do a rematch at Saturday night's main event. I just don't think they should miss out on doing that match at Survivor Series unless they do a triple threat involving Orton as well. So I thought the progression of the Orton-Owen stuff was well done. The follow-up from last week, the promo was great, him trying to justify why he's in the right and why he did what he did. It was very well done. We then get to our second triple threat tag team match of the night. The Motor City Machine Guns have finally arrived, debuting in the match against Los Garza, that being Berto, which is a dumb fucking version of Humberto, Humberto Carrillo. They just call him Berto now, whatever. Um, Him and Angel Garza. And then A-Town Down Under were also in this matchup. This was a fun match. I think I enjoyed the other match more, but I, I... was doing stuff I was unpacking during the show. When I had the show on in the background and I was unpacking and, and whatever. Uh, getting ready to go to fucking bed because I was exhausted. Because I got like three hours of sleep the night before. But, um, sub three hours of sleep. But I sat down specifically to watch this match and fucking loved it. I think the entrance for the Motor City Machine Guns is cool. Yes, it does indeed sound like a Def Rebel song. I dig it. I think it matches their vibe well. Uh, They were never going to use the TNA song. WWE loves to own everything. The TNA song is cool. Honestly, I feel like a new song is necessary for this new era of Motor City Machine Guns. So I had no issue with that at all. They look great here. I mean, the crowd didn't give them a great reaction. They were in fucking somewhere in South Carolina. That was my only nitpick over the thing. A a couple different nitpicks. I love the moment, first of all, which I'll get into why I'm so happy that they're here in a moment. But as far as the negative side... Um, one, they would have been better showcased in a straight-up tag team match, which was the original idea slash plan uh, before they changed into this tag team tournament match. They should have just saved their debut for next week. I know they were promoting it for this week, but they knew where they were going to be. They should have saved it for next week. If you're going to do the triple threat instead of having them be in a regular match with Los Garza, then it should have been in Brooklyn. Save the triple threat for next week. That crowd, I mean, they ended up getting behind them. There was a Motor City chant, um, like very early on in this match, which was cool to hear. But otherwise, there were a lot of people, I'm sure, in that crowd that did not know who these guys are, which is fine. I mean, they come from TNA, Ring of Honor. They weren't even in AEW, so it's not like they have that going for them. They won- they made one appearance there like two years ago or last year or whatever. That's it. Otherwise, they've always been in um, WWE, or I'm sorry, TNA and Ring of Honor, New Japan, whatever. So, the other thing I didn't really like about it was that they announced it ahead of time. So, because they changed plans, they put up a video on Twitter, which I did not see. I didn't see that. I just watched SmackDown. So, when they put up the graphic, because I see... So, first of all, the match is about to start, and they don't advertise the triple threat earlier on in the show, I don't think. And then 8 Sound Down Under is making their entrance, and you hear Grayson Waller go, Oh, Motor City who? And I'm thinking, that's weird that they would just, like, fucking spoil it like that. Okay. And then they put up the graphic and it has the Motor City Machine Guns in it. And I'm like, they're not even using this as a surprise. 
And it's because they put up a video before the show showing them meeting uh, with Nick Aldis, which is amazing because they're all former TNA World Champions. And interestingly, Nick Aldis' final TNA match was actually against Alex Shelley of the Motor City Machine Guns almost, you know, not exactly a year ago, um, but a year ago last summer at Slammiversary. He failed to beat Alex Shelley for the TNA World Championship. And then he reported to WWE like almost immediately after that. So I thought that was cool. But it would have been nice to get like that surprise pop in Brooklyn. I feel like you could have saved this for next week or do a two-on-two tag team match. Make it a surprise. Everyone kind of knew they were WWE bound. I get it. But they could have saved it as a surprise and get that great reaction from Brooklyn. They would have got a better reaction there anyway. And they're going to be... Listen, the one plus side of this is that they got their debut out of the way. So next week in the finals of this mini WWE Tag Team Championship number one contenders tournament, it's going to be Motor City Machine Guns against DIY. And that sounds fucking awesome. Give those guys the time. Do not shortchange them for time, please. Just give them the chance to go out there and steal the fucking show. That sounds awesome. Regardless of who wins, I think it would be Motor City, and it should be. I would just give them the fucking belts. Honestly, like, the Bloodline, I I, I like the former Gorillas of Destiny. Just give the Motor City Machine Guns the belts. That That's what I would do. Don't even, don't even waste your fucking time by having them, you know, wait to get an opportunity. They can, and I wouldn't be upset with that, but... If you want to fast-track them to tag team title contention, just give them the fucking belts, honestly. Um, They can work with all the teams they have on SmackDown, or they can chase. That's fine, too. But either way, I'm looking forward to that match. I am so happy they are here. As someone who started watching TNA in the summer of 08, I started watching wrestling in general in the spring of 08, April of 08 to be exact. I didn't really really know what TNA was because I just got into WWE. I had read about TNA when I was reading up on people's, like, <clears throat> Wikipedias and stuff like that, like, reading up on their backgrounds, like Carlito's background and shit like that. I saw these constant mentions in certain people's bios of TNA, like Kurt Angle's and stuff like that. I didn't even know who Kurt Angle was. And I'm thinking, that's interesting. Like, what's this TNA thing? And I was flipping through the channels one day, and I came across Spike TV on a Thursday night. I'm like, oh, shit, that's TNA. And I think if I had to make a list of my definitive favorite tag teams of all time, in no particular order, I think it would be Beer Money, the Hardys, and the Motor City Machine Guns. All three are former TNA Tag Team Champions. All three have spent time in TNA. The Hardys came from WWE first, which is how I knew about them. And I like them for other reasons as well. But I got to know Beer Money and Motor City Machine Guns. That series of tag team matches they had in 2010 might be my favorite series of tag team matches ever. I have just so I, I just have such fond memories of that time period in TNA, that series of matches in particular. But they were TNA regulars for the entire time I was... I mean, I've always watched TNA, dating back to when I first started watching wrestling, like I said, soon after I started watching in 08. But they were always there. They were there in 08, they were there in 09, they won the tag titles in 2010, they were there in 2011... 2012, they kind of went through separate ways. I think Chris Saban got hurt or something. Alex Shelley was a single star. Loved his, like, singles run that he had. And then by that point, I think they left um, to go do other shit. So they left TNA. And then Chris Saban, I think, went to Ring of Honor. And then Alex Shelley, they, they were doing their own thing for a while. And then they reunited in Ring of Honor. And I started watching Ring of Honor around that point, like, full-time in, like, 2015, 2016. And they got packed together around that point, which was awesome. And I was like, man, I fucking love the Motor City Machine Guns. This is really cool. And I got to see them in person at a couple Ring of Honor shows. I got to see them challenge for the tag titles. They finally won the Ring of Honor tag team titles about a year later from the Bucks in a great match. That was really fucking cool. Um, And I love the Ring of Honor run. And then by 2018, I think they kind of, Chris Saban had basically retired. Alex Shelley left. Um, I think he went off to go pursue medicine or whatever. And they kind of had a soft split. And I didn't think they would ever reunite. And again, they did. They reunited again in 2020 during COVID in TNA, which was fucking awesome. And they won back the TNA Tag Team titles. And on and off in TNA, because Shelly left for a while and then he came back. Um, He won the TNA World Championship, which was amazing. And they had a great return run in TNA from 2020 to 2024. And then the rumors started rumbling, like, where are they going to go next? And I thought for sure they were going to AEW. I mean, they just made sense. They, they're close with the Bucks, and that would, they would have been a great fit there. But I'm like, but what if? If WWE's interested, and they fucking should be, 
What if then they were in WWE? Because I was saying this to Mr. Marceau to RJ like a week or two ago. How many actual tag teams that were in TNA made their way to WWE? And we're not talking the Hardys who were already a WWE team. I'm talking teams that were teams in like Ring of Honor or WWE. There really aren't many. I'm sorry, in Ring of Honor or TNA that made their way to WWE. Gallows and Anderson, yeah. I mean, Gallows was already in WWE. But they were more of a New Japan team. I never really like knew a lot about them before they came to WWE, aside from the fact they were in the Bullet Club. But like, I'm talking like the era of TNA in which I was watching. The only team that would come to mind is um, Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly, Red Dragon. And even them, I didn't have like, this is so, I mean, I, I love their tag team in Ring of Honor. And I didn't have the same like uh, sentimental like value, I guess, towards them because I didn't really grow up watching them. I love their work in Ring of Honor and whatnot. And I was I thought it was awesome they got back together in WWE under Undisputed Era and whatnot. But even then, like WWE hasn't really brought in a lot of like teams that came from other companies. They really don't. Like they just bring in single stars, or if they do come in, they don't have a great run. Like, it's honestly kind of amazing. Like, you look through all the former TNA Tag Team Champions specifically. Not, I mean, Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions, too. But, like, what teams did WWE even hire? They didn't hire LAX, any incarnation of LAX. And if they tried to, they didn't They didn't get them. Um, the Bucks never won the TNA Tag Titles, right? But they were there. They never went to WWE. They haven't gone to WWE. They've wrestled in WWE. They haven't signed with WWE. Then British Invasion never went to WWE. Um, how many other teams? I mean, there's there's so many. Aries and Rude, Dirty Heels, were in WWE together for a while, but not like together together. They were just there at the same time. Um, the the Wolves, or I mean, Davy Richards, or rather Eddie Edwards, is still in TNA. I don't think he's ever leaving at this point. But yeah, man, there's a lot of TNA tag teams that WWE just either did not want to pick up, they couldn't get them, or whatever. They just brought in one of the members and not both. Like they brought in Brandon Walker. Remember him? They didn't bring in James Storm. Maybe he just wanted to stay. But Beer Money never got a run in WWE. They got a couple runs in TNA, which was cool. Never got a run in WWE. And Braden Walker came in, and he, you know, at that point he was having issues and whatever. But they didn't bring in America's Most Wanted as a team. They brought in just Brandon Walker. And that was it. Chris Harris. They didn't bring in Storm. So I think it's all of that to say it's really fucking cool. They brought in the Motor City Machine Guns and are calling them the Motor City Machine Guns in the same fucking week, no less. I mean, I, I, how could I forget the War Raiders? Um, they were a team that WWE brought in, which was cool. War Machine from Ring of Honor, and I thought it was cool when WWE brought them in because I'm thinking, oh, I watched them in Ring of Honor. It's cool to see them in WWE. They got an opportunity there. They've been successful there. They haven't had like the most amazing run, but they are former tag team champions and, and whatever. Um, and they've been there for for many years now. But yeah, I mean, in the same week that they went back to being called the War Raiders, uh, as opposed to, I mean, they can't call them War Machine, I guess, for, for whatever, copyright purposes, I don't know. They could have very easily changed Motor City Machine Guns' name. They are calling them the Machine Guns. Like, for a while there, Vince was like, we can't call anyone by a gun name, like the Machine Gun Carl Anderson. We can't call them that. We can't, uh... I don't know, we can't call Ember Moon the fucking war goddess because we don't want to use the word war for our characters, which is so fucking stupid. So I'm glad they I'm glad they got over that. Vince is gone. That's that's a big reason. But they just call them what they are. The fucking Motor City Machine Guns, Alex Shelley, Chris Saban. It's fucking awesome, man. I was really happy to see that. I've been excited all day. Um watching that debut back. I thought they did well. And I hope they can get over and have a great run in WWE and work with all their tag teams. Because they fucking deserve it, first of all, and they're still an amazing team. They are still one of the best tag teams in the wrestling world right now. I will put them up there with any team, and they are just as good. Even 20 years later, I fucking love the Motor City Machine Gun. So, I know that was a long story, but I'm just really happy to see them in WWE, and I hope they do well. And like I said, I would not be opposed to them winning the tag titles within the next month. I mean, at this point, what would be the harm? I mean, I guess you kind of rush it, but... They're a great fucking team, and they deserve it. So, And they would also become, I think, the second ever team to hold gold, tag team gold, in Ring of Honor, TNA, and WWE. The only other team to do that was the Hardys. And the Hardys actually won the WWE tag team gold first, and then the tag titles in TNA, and then the Ring of Honor tag titles. They did it in, like, reverse, where they won the TNA tag titles, the Ring of Honor tag titles. I think they were also champions in Japan. Could be wrong about that. Pretty sure they were also tag team champions in Japan. And 
now they're here in WWE as hopefully soon to be WWE Tag Team Champions. Fuck yeah, man. That's awesome. Um, as we, uh, I mean, anything but that would, was not nearly as exciting to talk about, but we did have a women's tag team match. It was supposed to be Nia and Tiffany against, uh, Bailey and Naomi, kind of a rematch from a month ago. I know we're all ready for them to move on from this. I get it. But Tiffany wasn't even there. She had like the flu or something they said in storyline. Uh, other than that, I'm not really sure why else she wouldn't be there aside from them wanting to put Candice in the match. It made Candice LeRae the replacement. Candice has barely been on SmackDown in recent months. I think she last competed on the show almost four months ago. She and Indy were having a bunch of matches with Bianca and Jade and all this other shit, and then she just disappeared from the show. She was back on Friday, and she actually pinned Bailey in this match. Now, granted, Indy helped her cheap, but she's a heel, so why wouldn't she help her? And then she pinned Bailey. That was all Bailey's doing, I guarantee you. Bailey loves Candice, they're close. She's wanted to see her get the spotlight for a while. This was her chance. She's not going to get over overnight, but it was a nice start. I thought the match was good. Loved the finish with Candice pinning Bailey. That was fucking great. Not even Naomi, who pinned Nia last week, so that would have been dumb. She pinned Bailey. And Bailey doesn't get beat all that often, so I thought that was really, really cool. Um, I mean, I guess Bailey does get beat often, but not by people like that are low on the totem pole like Candice LeRae, you know? So I thought that was really, really cool and a good match too. And they're building towards Nia and, and Naomi for the WWE Women's title. I would imagine they would do it before Crown Jewel. I mean, sooner the better, because if you do it like the SmackDown before Crown Jewel, then you know Nia's not going to lose. They already promoted her and Liv. I guess we've, we've seen title changes before Survivor Series in the past, before the champion versus champion matches. So I guess it could happen. I don't think they're doing it next week unless I miss something. And then the main event segment on the show, Roman Reigns did indeed come out and acknowledge Solo, but Solo said, you got to acknowledge me, but also as your tribal chief. And Roman was like, uh, I'm not doing that. So they brought out Jimmy Uso, beat the shit out of him, and then they beat the shit out of Roman Reigns. And again, again stood tall over Roman and Jimmy. They need help, brother. They need help and they need Jey Uso. So this was more simple stuff, but I thought it was well done. I I thought it was a really good segment. Um, And they furthered this along and it gives them even more of a reason to want Roman and Jimmy. Um, you know, to, it, it, it gives them more of a reason to want Jey Uso on their side and reunite the OG bloodline and hopefully apologize and make up for all the abuse and the betrayals and all that other bullshit um, in the last four or five years. Three, four years. So, yeah, good show. Love the fucking Motor City debut. Like I said, I cannot get over that. The rest of the show was good. The Candice win in the tag team match was cool to see as well. I'm digging the Bloodline stuff. That's well done. The Cody Owens-Orton storyline is cool. They gave... Uh, we had another women's match on the show, which was fine. It wasn't long, but they, I thought it was cool. And the renewed focus on the tag team division is really cool to see. Enjoyed SmackDown. Two thumbs up this week. Hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Be sure to like this video, drop a comment, share the video. All your support is greatly appreciated. Um, check out my SmackDown Lowdown review also up today or tomorrow. Be sure to check out all the other content here on the channel. And above all else, check out our new store on Pro Wrestling Tees. ProWrestlingTees.com backslash WrestleRant. Support the brand, support the channel, support what I do. By buying a shirt today, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, folks. Have an awesome one. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Go Motor City, baby. And I'll catch your ass down the road.